Welcome to Friday Focus, September 16th, 2016. And we're getting back into kind of our busy season. We had a little kind of slowdown during the summertime. Those of you who are new and think it's been pretty busy, these are actually our slowest weeks, last couple weeks of August, first couple weeks of September. So here it comes. And I want to talk to you about how you can increase your own, you know, capacity. It's, you know, I, when I see people really put their head in the right place and really focus on, you know, getting things right, that their capacity is virtually limitless. One thing is your personal capacity might be capped by the amount of hours you have in a day to be at work or be at home and do your things. And then you have your ability to really concentrate and not waste much time. And then you have your ability to, you know, to delegate. Okay, so we have the ability to delegate, which makes you, your capacity go up. You have your ability to be efficient and not waste time. I see a lot of wasted time. And you have your ability, of course, just to you know, just produce work. But one key concept, you know, we talked about at the Scheduling Institute uh, this last week about you know, staying in your bubble, like kind of focusing on things that you have control over, such as you know, patient experience, your interaction with coworkers, your doing your job properly, trying to eliminate mistakes. And then we have all the outside things like, you know, who's going to be the next president and uh, the economy and the interest rates, gas prices. We have no control of those. That's outside our bubble. Maybe you're coming to work and you've had some problems at home. Those really shouldn't be brought into work. You know, you're in effect negative to your coworkers. And the concept is a step up from that, which is uh, be here now. And be here now refers to where are you at now, you should focus on one conversation at a time, on one task at a time, on one decision at a time, on one person at a time. And what happens is that we too often think that we can multitask and get a lot of things done. In fact, people are really proud of the fact that I can really multitask good. And when you think you're really good at multitasking, science has shown that you're actually kind of horrible at it and you haven't recognized the fact that you waste a lot of time going from task to task. I was writing this book, I'm kind of happy to get that done, and I'd find that I had to really kind of be at home, away from work to write it, and I had to let my wife know in advance, I, I really, not being rude, but I don't want you talking to me or telling me, look out the window at this boat going by, because when that happened, my thought process would have to stop when I was reading or writing, and then to get that synchronized going back again takes a long time, in fact, they say up to 25 times longer than just continuing it. If you're seeing a patient and they give you a, like your new patient experience and you're talking to them about what they're here for and you kind of have that in your head and now you get called to go do another task before you present that and do the sign off to somebody else, it actually becomes very inefficient because now the next person either doesn't have the advantage of having that discussion that you had with the patient or when you go back to do it, you forgot and you got to rethink about it, look at your notes and start over again. It's very inefficient. I was on Livonia the other day and they were talking to me about how they were having to uh, do a lot of auditing of the charts. And the auditing of the charts is a good example of not being here now because that implies that we did it wrong in the first place. So somebody does their chart, and this is on the vein patients, and there's some signatures missing and forms not filled out. And it, they get checked out. And then the next day a, a clerical person goes through and sees there's all these things missing. So then she's got to figure out based on the signatures who the heck it was. I mean, that's hard. And then when are they working next so I can put it on her desk to fill it out. And then now you get that chart a week later, you can't remember the patient. You're not sure if it's your writing or not. You don't know what you're supposed to fill out so you kind of do maybe, maybe not a great job. And that's not being here now is what you did is you let the chart escape your hands before you completed your task. And now to do it later on takes way more time and is very inefficient. And really as a practice, we need to get rid of auditing. You know, I thought we had gotten rid of it before, but apparently haven't. Auditing means that we are accepting a high error rate and we're having some third party correct them. I talked to you before about uh, the, it's called the Toyota production system. They call it TPS. In America, we call it lean. Let's talk about how that relates to us. In the 80s, there was a plant called the NUMMI, N-U-M-M-I plant, which was in uh, California, Fremont, California. And it was known to be the worst auto plant in the, in the country, in the world probably. And they had the highest defect rate. And they had, you know, these workers were coming to work drunk and they were putting cans in the doors. And people, so the drivers would find out later on, they're just rattling around their car. There's a can in there, some joke or bolts or nuts. 
And uh, they were going to do a joint venture with Toyota, and Toyota executives came over and they saw the negative motivation of the employees at GM, uh, how bad their behavior was, how sloppy they were, and how much, uh, how much damage they did actually to the company. And they started interviewing the workers, and the workers knew there was one, you know, one mission. The mission was do not stop the line, keep the line going. Every time you stop the line, it costs fifteen thousand dollars a second of lost production to get it going again. So they had one case where in the same plant where somebody had fallen into the track and was killed, not because they didn't stop the line, but they didn't stop the line to get the guy out until a supervisor came by and stopped the line. The frontline workers had no ability to stop the line. So Toyota worked with the, G, the, the GM workers and they developed a system where they were, what they were doing in Japan, which is very effective. They were actually beating us in the car race at that time. And they would let anybody in the production line stop the line when they saw a defect. And what would happen, when Toyota would have a car roll off the production line, the car was functioning. It had very few defects per, say, 100 cars because they were fixing them as they were presenting. So if the Toyota, the Toyota worker saw something being assembled improperly or the last guy did something wrong, he'd stop the line, fix it, and get it going in. Whereas in GM, what they were doing, they were letting the car go right down the line. It's not my job, not my job. Get to the end. There'd be a list of defects, and some engineers would tear the car apart and replace the stuff. And their production per worker was about half because they were ripping the car apart and fixing things after it was fabricated. It was absurd. And that's kind of what all automakers in the United States adopted, but that took 30 years. And how about like auditing the charts? If you don't do your chart right in the first place, we can miss a bill, <coughs> pardon me, which has a negative impact on the company's income, obviously. Uh, you got to do a lot more work because now you got to fill it out later on when you're, you know, you don't remember the patient. We're having to pay somebody else to do the job you were supposed to do in the first place. That's ridiculous. And I'll just one example, you know, and that's about back about be here now. If you have a job to do, you should be focused on that job. If you have a task to do, focus on that task. If you're in a conversation with a patient, you know, phone's vibrating, ignore it. I take my phone to the meetings now because I think in my head I'm telling myself I'm doing it so I can use a calculator on it. In reality, I'm checking my little iWatch to see what the message was from. I laughed today during one. Uh, we had a patient that thought she lost her, you know, her balloon, the gastric balloon turned out, you know, it wasn't, but a little joke and I, I laugh at it. I didn't need to see that and I would miss sort of a part of the discussion. And uh, the be here now means when you're in a conversation, you're paying attention. When you're working with your coworkers in your huddle, you know, phone's not on and you're not, you know, is on vibrate and you're not paying attention to it. You're ready to engage with your other coworkers. When you're making a decision, that's the only thing you should be focusing on is that decision. You make it quickly and then move on to the next one. And multitasking is a myth, okay? When you multitask, you are very good at doing a lot of jobs poorly. So somebody says, I'm a great multitasker. Great, you're really good at doing a lot of stuff poorly. And I always kind of pride myself on a multitasker because I kind of survive, survive in chaos. And now I'm finding, as I'm getting more mature and understanding it better, that I'm better off really focusing on something or someone, meeting with them, getting it done, then moving to the next job. Now I want to tell you something a little different than multitasking is triaging. So I come from the emergency room environment where we'd have to triage. And if there's a kid with a sore throat and a guy with chest pain and sweating and a person that was dead, we would triage the dead guy, we're not going to touch him, you know, eliminate that work. And the guy with the heart attack we're going to take care of right now, and the kid with a sore throat might have to wait. Okay? In a mass casualty situation, you got to triage. And even when I'd have a bunch of patients coming at one time, maybe 10 patients came in as a surge, we had no control over that. I had to see who needed my attention right away, what things could wait, uh, what things had to be, could be handled quickly. You know, sometimes when I'm on the floor, I get a list of three, three patients to see. Something can be handled really quickly, like a fifth Botox treatment for this patient knock it out of the park, get it done versus the consult. I might wait a few minutes on that one because I know they need my attention. So triage and multitasking are different. Triaging means you're making a decision where your time should be spent. But be here now means when you're in the room with the patient, that's your focus. And you focus on getting your charting done right. You're focusing on getting your paperwork right, getting the best treatment. You're focused on answering the patient's questions. Do they need aftercare instructions? And be here now when you're communicating with your coworkers. Okay, when you're talking to somebody, you're making a decision, you're doing a task, be here now. When you're in the meeting, and you're in meetings, be at the meeting, don't have your head somewhere else. Maybe leave your phone somewhere outside. I think that's maybe not necessary, but you should be engaging your phone or having side conversations. So that's the Friday Focus, and uh, you know, we're getting into our, our busy season. 
Uh, I just want to give you us a reminder that the right now I'm doing a lot of work with the vein teams at every office to really increase their production. And it's not a, you know, don't stop the line. It's a problem with production. You obviously you stop things and get it taken care of. But I want you to remind you that the vein production is the economic engine that drives this practice. Okay, so it allows us to, to start a dermatology program. It takes us a couple years at a loss, but we can survive that because we have the, the, the vein practice that's robust. It allows us to start doing things like stem cells. We can start expending energy and money and time and resources on doing things and offering new things for our patients. We're expanding the hormones. But the vein production is the economic backbone of the practice, particularly in the newer offices. So we're going to really work on work with your teams on getting no barriers to getting patients into production. That's been a little something that we've really kind of improved upon in the last couple of weeks. I'm proud of you guys did a great job. We're just going to keep removing barriers. We're figuring out some ways to even remove barriers faster. So that, that's uh, going to be great. And thank you very much. Have a great weekend.